Uh, just so, because some of you have heard, some of us haven't heard, but um, we have a new worship minister who will be starting the first Sunday in uh, September. Uh, the, her name is Lacey Schwen? Schwen. See, if you, if you ask her, Sorry, um, Lacey, come on up.
<laughs> as I think about things, I always, my favorite scripture is John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And I think about that scripture and how fitting that is even for this time. What was Jesus doing right there? He was comforting his disciples who were concerned about the future and what was to come and what their lives would be like. And is that not a very mirror image of where we've been as a society and a people and a race even? And we, we don't know the future. But he made it really clear what the future was, right? That future is on the cross, forgiven, raised to victory. And we just keep that in mind. There's nothing going to happen on this earth that he can't overcome, hasn't overcome. We just have to have that faith in Father. Thank you, Jesus.
Good morning, everyone. The last time I did this, I had forgot all about that I had to do this. What I was going to say that day is up here right now. We do this every week. Peter drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, guilty of the body and blood. But let a man examine himself. And so let him. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy So we know this is a time of self-examination. We've been through that. We've talked about that. It's, it's a gift. So let's do that right now. To allow this for the 20 seconds. So for 20 seconds, in the way that we normally do, it's not particularly assembling in an unworthy manner. For 20 seconds, let's get it going. How many here can relate to the statement, I'm my own worst enemy? When you get alone with your thoughts, maybe you get into a little bit of darkness, you tear yourself down. And when we, we self-examine ourselves, we often think about the things that we're lacking, the things that we've done wrong or our shortcomings. Or maybe agreements that we have that we haven't quite dealt with in a way that we feel we should. The weight is on our heart. So today, we have that out of the way, right? So as we're partake of these emblems, let's partake of them in a way of what they speak to us and what he said to them, said to us through these emblems. Is I love you. I love you. I know you're yesterday. I know you're today. I know you're tomorrow. But I love you. He said, With this, you are my brothers and sisters. You are co-heirs to the kingdom of our Father. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. His proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now hath obtained mercy. Mercy. When he said, Our God, we are that important to him. He went to prepare a place 
He went to prepare a place for you. He will come again and receive you to himself. That where he is, you may be also. And it was for our advantage. It was for our benefit that he go away. The helper could not have come. He so much as we could comprehend, comprehend how much we are loved. As my Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. The same that I have remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my command, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. And he tells us, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. And these things I command you, that you love one another. Don't sell yourself short. We have the right ourselves as the as the child so when you examine yourself don't leave that part out because that is it all about Amen. if you're visiting here today we invite you to partake of these things with us as co-heirs with Christ if we indeed share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory.
get what these guys did. So we're going to look at the early church. Amen. What did the early church preach? Acts chapter 2 is the first recorded sermon. On the day of Pentecost, they were all gathered together in one place. So here we have a Jewish sermon, and that's kind of what I put in my notes. This is just kind of a Jewish sermon, and this is why I entitled it a Jewish sermon, because Peter is preaching to Jews. These Jews were aware of who Jesus was, okay? They had a base knowledge of who Jesus was. And, and I chuckled as I thought about this, because three weeks ago, I wasn't completely sure that this was the way I was going with this. I think it was about three weeks ago. It might have been somewhere around three or four weeks ago. Um, I was getting, I think it was getting ready time for church. And, and Gary, Gary Tucker, I told him I was going to mention him this morning. He came up to me and he reminded me that, you know, in, in the book of Acts, in chapter 2, if you look at Peter's sermon and you read it out loud from verses 14 to 36, it was only like four minutes. And he converted 3,000 people. And then Gary, <laughs> Gary goes, I dare you to do better. <laughs> I said, I'll try, but I don't think I'm going to make it. Double dare you. Gary's got somewhere to go. No, <laughs> no, but it's really cool because I was reading through it again. And, you know, you get down to verse 40, 41 area, and it says, now there are other things that Peter said. We don't know how long that that was, but I just chuckled as like, you know, God's like telling me this four weeks ago through Gary, and then all of a sudden I'm studying this as we look at it. But why I mentioned that they're all gathered together in one place, and this is kind of a crazy little ordeal because all but it says in verse 2, suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came down from heaven. Who they 
are, it doesn't matter what they say. You still be the bigger person, and you still treat that person with respect. It doesn't matter if they've dishonored you 77 times. You still treat them with respect. Because maybe one day it will click. One day they will hear Jesus. But not hear Jesus, but hear Jesus. So Peter, again, with respect to his audience, he informs them of what time it was. He informs them of what's happening. And then he goes into his sermon. Here's the first part of Peter's sermon in verses 16 through 20. He goes, now all of this has happened because of what the prophet Joel had said. In the last days, God says, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people. Right here is where he pours out the spirit. You and I, Acts 2, 38, right at the end of this message, like he tells us how we can get the Holy Spirit. He says, God has finally poured out his Holy Spirit on everyone. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men dreams. Even on my servant. Now, like, it's not exclusive for just a king or a just some big prophet to get the Holy Spirit. You can be anybody and get the Holy Spirit. Last, last days. These are the last days. Okay, skip the second coming stuff because I really want to get into the meat of this down in verses 22 through 24. Look at Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man by miracles, wonders, signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death. Peter just tells us this is what happened. God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross. It was deliberate. It was all part of his plan. God knew it by his foreknowledge. God knew it because he had deliberately planned all of this out. He deliberately planned this all out. Like, it just makes you stop and wonder for just a second. Okay, when God created all mankind, he's like, okay, here's the one and only rule. God goes, but. So, let's do this. He didn't stay dead. God raised him from the dead. Okay? He's throwing blame kind of on everybody. He says, it's okay because it's all part of God's plan. And God raised him from the dead. Why? Because it was impossible for God. He just couldn't stay dead. He goes, now let me tell you a little bit about David. Why would he talk about David? Because he knew his audience. And his audience knew who David was. Because he's at the right hand, and I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices, and my body also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of death. But your presence. Peter used the Old Testament to remind the Jews what he was telling them right now. And we, in retrospect, have the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have the whole picture. What did Peter do? Number one, he respected his audience. Number two, he at least was in the word of God. He knew what it said. He knew what it said. He said, this is what David said. And David was applying it to David, but I'm telling you today, this is Jesus. And then he says in verse 29, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that David is dead and that he's buried and that his tomb is still here today. But he was a prophet and knew that God promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. And seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not advantage to the realm of death, nor did his body ever see decay, but God raised Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. 
exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit has been poured out. What you now see and what you now hear is the effects of the Holy Spirit upon us. For David did not ascend into heaven, yet he said the Lord. Again, the totality of his message. Jesus came. Jesus died. Because there was a sin problem. Even David mentioned Jesus. The Bible tells you about it. And then, not only that, Jesus is now alive very much and at the right hand of God. Therefore, verse 36, let all of Israel be assured that this God has made this Jesus, the new Christ of God, both Lord and Messiah. He's the appointed. He's the master. He is reigning. He is both Lord and Christ. And he's going to come back. And at this point, like he doesn't even have to say that Jesus is coming back. Because it's at this point in the message that people are like, oh man, we understand this. It makes sense. Why it didn't make sense the three years that Jesus was trying to preach it to these people, all of a sudden made sense. And then they ask what they must do. But I want to skip over to what we must do stuff. And I want to go to Acts 17. And I want to go to the Gentiles from because most likely, and chances are, this is where we're going to find ourselves. In, in Acts 17, this is what's going on. The Apostle Paul, and pardon me if I say Peter every now and again because of, you know, P and D. But the great sermon that Paul preaches to the church in Athens, or not to the church in Athens, but to the Athenians, as one author noted, that there's some humor in ancient writings where it's said of the Athenians that it's easier to find a god than a man there. And I stop for just a second because I really want to, I want to say that one more time. This is what they said of the community of the Athenians. It is easier to find a god there than a man. How many of us can see that in the United States? to find a God there than a man. And you can turn anything into a God. But what I really want us to catch and what I really want us to see is, is verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting, he was waiting for Timothy and he was waiting for Silas to join him in, in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And look at what it says in verse 17. He reasoned in the synagogue of Jews and God-fearing Greeks as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happen to be there. And I pause for just a second because I want to say this. It was not a one-day thing. Okay? It was not one day. You know what I'm saying? You know what? I'm going to go share Jesus with the first person I see. And by the way, they're going to accept Jesus as Christ. That's not what Paul did. It said day by day, week by week. We don't know how long it took for them to actually... For it to click. And so you and I cannot get upset when we go out and it doesn't click the first time. I can't get upset about that. But this is what happens. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. And some of them asked, what is this battle I'm trying to say? Others some foreign God. In the resurrection. And I pause for just a second because, again, just like Peter, Paul knew his audience. He was teaching to the Gentiles. He was also teaching to Epicurean philosophers. But this is what you have to do. You and I have to have friends. Or we have to know people who don't know Jesus Christ. And we have to befriend them. We can't just cast a judgment on them. Amen. Say, oh, you live in sin. Amen. You shouldn't do that. Amen. Do you even know what you're doing? No, they don't know what they're doing. You may not know what you're doing. Sometimes I don't know what I'm doing. But let me tell you, here, here's what an Epicurean philosopher, this is what they taught. That mentality is, if it's good, eat, drink, and be merry. 
Narcissism at its finest, which means that this I'm going to do it. Which means when he was talking to Epicurean philosophers, you know, drink as much as you want, eat as much as you want, have as many relationships as you want. It's fine. Christ. 
He's going to get there. But I'm telling you, here's Jesus Christ. God's not going to overlook anything anymore. Verse 31, for judgment is coming. And he has pointed a day when he will judge the entire world with justice by Jesus, whom he has appointed. And Jesus has been given proof, um, and he has given proof to this day to everyone by raising Jesus from the dead. And there's no death. That's the gospel message. He raised him from the dead. One day he's going to judge. And because he's going to judge, he can no longer overlook your sins. Unless you have asked him to forgive you of them. And I'm going to pause at verse 32. I want to come back to verse 32, but I want to pause there. Because let's talk about our sermon. What should our sermon look like? Converting the world to Christ is being seen more and more as the job of the church or the local church. Or it's your job, not mine. That's why we pay you. Stop saying that you pay me. Okay, can we just can we just do that right now? Amen. Stop saying that you pay me. Stop saying that you pay Lindsay. When I'm long and gone and the next guy comes, stop, don't say that you pay that person. The Bible says the worker is worthy of his wages. Yeah. We are giving to God and God is providing for us. Okay? It's, it's not us. But more and more, and I see it and I hear it in churches all the time. Well, he stepped on my toes. I'm not giving any money to God. That's between you and God. Why on earth would they have, would they have these plastic white chairs for me to sit in? They can't afford real chairs? I ain't going to give any money until they can afford some real Come on now. <laughs> Speaking of chairs real quick. Okay, we're getting chairs in on Tuesday. If you're going to be around at 8 a.m. and you want to help us unload those chairs. <laughs> given to God. And so when we do that, don't think I get a check from the church that is no longer your job to preach the word of God. Yes, it is. And it's my job on the other six days outside of church service to do the same thing that I'm telling you to do. Peter's audience knew of a God. Paul's audience knew of a God that they worshipped, but they didn't know who it was. Peter's audience knew who Jesus was. When you and I speak to people, it's like, have you heard of Jesus? Yes. Okay, good. Let me tell you a little bit more about him. <laughs> have you heard of Jesus? No. Let me tell you about Jesus. Know Jesus. Know what you believe. And let me just share with you a few practical steps as we get ready to close this morning. Here's some practical steps. Number one, don't do anything until you've prayed about it. Amen. Because the greatest weapon that we have against the spiritual warfare that rages on in each one of us is prayer. Yes. Having God in our corner is far greater than anything else we're ever going to do. Sometimes God will say, no, don't do that. All right, you asked me for help, and I'm saying, don't do that. Or when God, God, please help me, you're like, God's like, okay, but you've got to do this. And don't, don't think about it. But pray. Nothing will ever be accomplished as big and as important as asking the God of creation to do the impossible for us. Remember, all things are possible with him. 
Remember, in Acts chapter 2, what were the apostles doing? They were all gathered together in the upper room and they were praying. Never to go where they are. And I love that about Acts chapter 17. Paul went to Athens. And he just had conversations with people. He didn't bring his Old Testament Bible and start me to believe what Jesus is. I want to get the Bible for this point. Don't wait for an opportune time because it will never come as long as it depends upon you. If you hear anything, please hear that. Do not wait for an opportune time as long as it depends upon you because it's never going to happen. You just go where they are and you do it. You know somebody who doesn't know Jesus and they've got time, you've got time, go where they are. Be courageous. I don't know how many times if you read the, the letters by the apostles, how many times over and over again they said, pray for us, pray that we have boldness. Because you get the sense that they didn't really want to do it. The solution to the problem, Jesus Christ. All day, every day. One author notes, the further and further we get away from the biblical writers, the further and further away we're getting away from the knowledge in the United States of America that people know what John 3.16 is. And that, I can't fathom that. It's noted that 75% of Americans do not even know what John 3.16 actually says. 75% can't even identify or can't, can't even define the gospel message. And we need to start exercising our faith over our fear. Don't make it overly complicated. Just keep it. As the praise team moves their way up to the stage this morning. I, I looked up three words this week. I will not. And I just want you to see these on the screen with me, if you would. These, these three words, I will not. The first one, Peter says of God, or Peter says, like the night that Jesus is going to Peter even sitting at the table with Jesus says, even though they all may fall away, I will not. What happened? He fell away. Because he tried to do it in himself. Jesus says in John, to eat and drink and prove this fight again until I return. In Acts 2.25, we looked at it this morning, it says, I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken, says David. Romans 15, verse 18. I will not venture to speak of anything through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. Look at what Paul, Paul says. I will not venture to do anything, to say anything apart from what Jesus Christ has accomplished. Again, it's never about you. It's never about me. It's always about him every day. I don't save you. Your mom doesn't save you. Grandpa doesn't save you. Only Jesus saves you. 6.12, Paul says, I have the right to do anything I want. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything. But I will not be mastered by anything. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 5. I will not boast when it comes to myself. 
Jesus says, the one who is victorious will lie.
doors open for someone to come get that free great gift of grace. But I also want to challenge you with an invitation of serving and going out, just as the sermon talked about. Matthew 25, after a lot of parables, Jesus is talking about the separation of the sheep and the goats. And what he's telling us there is when you fed the least of these, housed the least of these, or visited the least of these, you are going that up to me. That is our job. Grace is free. Our job is to go out and share with everybody else and bring everybody here. That should also be part of our invitation each and every day to everybody in our lives.